Uh, well, thank you so much um, for the introduction and thank you so much for the invitation to speak here today. Um, I, I really enjoyed um, the previous speakers um, from like postdoctoral researchers and grad students from really a diverse group. And well, I think there is still a lot of work we have to do and we have to educate ourselves. I think events like this um, also part of um, building an inclusive environment and a supportive system um, for our black colleagues but um, also other minorities in our community so i'm very excited to to be part of this um, community so today um, yeah i'm excited to um, present some ideas and strategies how we can probe and understand what is surrounding almost every cell in the body the extracellular matrix so this three-dimensional scaffold um, where cells here shown in red, they're surrounded by this extracellular matrix, which provides biophysical and biochemical support. And within single tissues, the extracellular matrix is constantly being remodeled as cells build and reshape it by degrading and then reassembling it. And so any disruption to these control mechanisms may lead to disease, such as fibrosis, here shown on the right, where the organization and the architecture is um, markedly disrupted. And our understanding of these uh, mechanisms is limited mainly because it is so difficult to probe the extracellular matrix in vivo. But then over the last um, years, decades, biomaterials and in particular hydrogels have evolved to mimic certain aspects of the extracellular matrix. And so hydrogels are these water swarm and polymer networks that can be designed to mimic specific biophysical biochemical cues and we use them for two-dimensional cell culture as well as for 3D cell culture, so encapsulating embedding cells, which really allowed us to better understand how cells respond to their environment. And so the seminal work was done more than a decade ago um, where hydrogels were used to understand how cells respond to the mechanical signals. And so one of the um, highlights of the work in 2006 was that the authors showed conclusively that cells respond to the elasticity of their environment. And this seems obvious right now, but it was a conceptual advancement at the time. And then we've continued to make progress in the field, for example, by including viscoelasticity, so more closely mimicking the native extracellular matrix. But at the same time, in certain cases, it has been difficult to instruct cells for longer time periods. And I would like to give you one example. So cations. Cations are well known in the field um, to form these very early cell-to-cell -cell contacts, which are important during um, development of many tissues. But when we encapsulate cells into our hydrogels, you may appreciate that they're way too far apart from each other to actually form these cell-to-cell -cell contacts. And as engineers, we thought, well, we can mimic this, right? We can engineer peptides um, that mimic the cation. And in fact, our lab and many others have shown that when we encapsulate cells into these cation mimetic hydrogels, we see this increase in collagen type 2, so which is a tissue-specific marker for this example, um, within three days. However, after a few more days, this cell response is lost. So it seems like we are only able to instruct cells for a very short time period. But why is that? Well, we've become um, excellent in measuring cell responses, so gene protein expression. We also have developed all these fantastic tools to measure the biomaterials properties. But at the same time, cells constantly remodel their environment. And the secretion of proteins is one aspect, including the secretion of extracellular matrix proteins. And this had largely been ignored in the field, mainly because we have not been able to visualize these nascent proteins. And therefore, we first um, had to develop a tool that allows us to visualize all these secreted, I call them nascent proteins. And so here we rely on the substitution of methionine. This is an amino acid which is found in almost all the extracellular matrix proteins. And we can substitute it with an analog, which is very similar, but it has this aside side chain. And that means we can then tag this aside side chain using cycloaddition, for example, by using one of these fluorophore conjugated um, cycloctines, DBCO. And that means in an experimental setup, we feed our cells with this analog in a methionine free environment. And after a very specific time period, we can then um, fluorescently label all these proteins that these cells have secreted. 
How does it look like? Well, here we're looking at a cell <clears throat> with the membrane labeled in red. And this cell was cultured for one day in this methionine analog media. And the nascent protein labeling shown in gray shows that they're surrounded by this mesh-like structure. So these are the proteins that these cells have secreted or the cell has secreted within the 24 hours. And today I would like to show you two examples where we use this metabolic labeling to probe how cells shape their environment in in vitro um, engineered microenvironments. So for our first application in tissue engineering, we decided to use a non-degradable hydrogel, which is based on hyaluronic acid as a backbone, and we use chondrocytes, so cartilage-specific cells. And we cultured these cells in chondrogenic media with this methionine analog, and the nascent proteins, again shown in gray, they show that within one day, they're surrounded by these nascent proteins. And they accumulate these proteins as shown by this quite thick layer around the cell. And then we decided to um, perform these um, or make, um, make these um, intensity profile plots of nascent proteins and the cell in red. And these really allow, or at different locations around each cell, and here shown for an average of 40 cells. And we did this because it allows us to measure um, the average nascent protein thickness of these cells, indicating that there is an increase in the thickness over time. And this really then raised the question, well, we know the nascent proteins are accumulating, but where is the hydrogel? And what is happening at this interface between the cell and our engineered microenvironment? And we decided to use fluorescent beads and um, we encapsulated them. And because they're, they are much bigger than the average mesh size of our hydrogel, we hypothesized we should be able to visualize whether the nascent matrix is pushing, so physically displacing the hydrogel from the cell, or if the matrix is interdigitating, so interdispersing um, with this existing hydrogel. And we should be able to, visual, uh, to quantify this by measuring the distance of these beads from the cell membrane. And so we did that and we co-encapsulated beads with the cells. The beads are shown in yellow here. And we found they're homogeneously distributed and they maintain their distribution over seven days. And if we look a little bit closer at each cell, and in particular at these images where there's no nascent proteins labeled here, these white arcs indicate that there's an increasing gap between the cell in the actual hydrogel environment. And we also quantified this by measuring the distance, which indicated there's an increasing distance um, showing that these, or indicating that these nascent proteins really physically displace the hydrogel from the cell. And this ability of these proteins to actually push it may also depend on the hydrogel properties itself, such as the mechanical properties. And this is something easily addressable in our hydrogel system where we can simply increase the cross-linker concentration to increase the mechanical properties. And that allowed us to um, fabricate two, di two different hydrogels which are on the softer side or a little bit stiffer. And again, we encapsulated these cells, these chondrocytes, we cultured them, and we found that the nascent proteins seem to be thinner in the four cells that were cultured in the stiffer hydrogels which is also confirmed by the significant decrease in the nascent protein thickness. So the hydrogel properties um, control, seem to control the nascent matrix thickness, but do they also affect the mechanical properties of the matrix itself? And we decided to um, use uh, fluorescent, uh, fluorescent guided nano um, atomic force microscopy. And again, we culture these cells um, for seven days, we stain for the nascent proteins, and then we prepared these very thin slices of snap frozen cells and gels. And then nano indentation allowed us to um, generate these force maps at a, a location, at a very specific location or edge of a cell. And so these force maps, well, first they allowed us, um, they showed us that we can measure the hydrogel modules. So it's approximately five kilopascal and 15 to 20 kilopascal. But if we now take a closer look at the cell shown in gray and this pericellular matrix around these cells, the modulus seems to be very similar between the two different groups. But it ex extends much further into the hydrogel for these cells that were cultured in the softer hydrogels, which again confirms our nascent matrix, nascent protein labeling. 
So to summarize um, this, this initial part, um, thinking about whenever we encapsulate cells into these engineered hydrogels, quite rapidly they're surrounded by their own nascent matrix and they probably lost the direct contact to these engineered microenvironments. And in addition to these, I would say, quite simple applications of hydrogels, this um, nascent matrix may also be important in uh, more fundamental studies, such as in mechanobiology, where our um, goal is to understand how cells respond to mechanical forces. And so mechanical forces, we know they're very important in tissue development, tissue repair, as well as in tissue disease, such as fibrotic remodeling. And here it is well understood, for example, that in response to a stiffening of the tissue, we often see a proliferation of fibroblasts, which will then feed into more tissue stiffening. And in fact, hydrogels, they were fundamental here in um, better understanding how these signals regulate cells. And in addition to just the elasticity that I'm showing here, um, other hydrogel properties were found to be critical, including the degradability as well as the viscoelasticity, so the stress relaxation of these hydrogels. And therefore, in our next study to understand how nascent proteins are involved in this, we use the hydrogel that is degradable, so enzymatically degradable by the encapsulated cells. And here we use mesenchyma stroma cells. And we cultured these cells um, this time it's just standard growth media without any differentiation factors. And again, we saw that the nascent proteins in Cray, they form this structure around the cells very early on, and it seems to increase over the culture period. In addition, these cells, um, they seem to be able to spread. And when we quantify cell spreading, there are many measures, um, and one is the aspect ratio. So the ratio between the shortest and the longest dimension of a cell. And in fact, we found that the aspect ratio increases over the culture period of six days, indicating that these cells are able to spread um, in these gels. So now given that these cells are surrounded by this nascent matrix and not in contact probably anymore um, with the hydrogel, we wanted to understand whether it is the adhesion to very specific proteins of their nascent matrix. And therefore, in addition to our control groups, we cultured these cells <clears throat> also with soluble RGD, so a peptide, <clears throat> excuse me, that is quite unspecifically um, inhibiting or blocking the integrins of these cells, so quite broad and unspecific. But we also used some function perturbing antibodies um, against either collagen, so here using an antibody against the alpha 2 integrin domain, or against the cell adhesive domain of fibronectin. And in fact, we found that. Um, perturbing adhesion to nascent proteins significantly reduced um, the ability of these cells to spread. But it was not completely abrogated when adhesion to collagen or fibronectin was blocked, which indicates probably that there's multiple protein interactions involved in these processes. So that means whenever we encapsulate cells for mechanobiology studies, it seems to be really the adhesion to the nascent matrix. But then what is with remodeling? So these cells should constantly remodel their environment, right? And so this is difficult to study in a system where we rely on degradable crosslinkers, right? And therefore we decided to use um, a different hydrogel system that cells can physically remodel. And so this system is basically a double network, so an interpenetrating polymer network, where the first network um, is based on reversible bonds. So these are guest host bonds, which can form spontaneously, but they can also be broken when a cell is pulling or pushing on it. And the second one is um, these non-decredible bonds, so that are not um, decredible. And these hydrogels are formed um, by mixing and simultaneously cross-linking, which leads to this interpenetration. And the beauty of this hydrogel system is that we can adjust the properties depending on the concentration of either network. So if you look at an example here um, at urology, at a given elastic modulus, here shown in Cray, increasing the amount of reversible bonds in the system increases the um, viscous modulus, so the loss modulus of these hydrogels. And interestingly, when we encapsulated cells into these different hydrogels, we found that cell spreading increased as a function of the viscosity, so the function of reversible bonds in the system. <clears throat> 
And given that, um, we decided to use this one composition to now understand how nascent proteins are involved. And in fact, these cells, they spread very well, as shown by these pretty high aspect ratios. And they were surrounded by a thick layer, a thin layer of nascent proteins. And this now raised the question, well, are these nascent proteins needed at all? And so here uh, we used exo one exo one is a molecule that blocks um, exocytosis and vesicular trafficking. And in fact, these cells did not spread. And similarly, um, or yeah, we used also an antibody, uh, not an antibody, um, an agent to block remodeling. So here using TIM3, which is an endogenous inhibitor of MMPs. And well, these cells, cell spreading was similarly significant to reduce, but I think it is obvious that these cells, they accumulated the proteins within their paracellular space. So whenever we, that means whenever we use these hydrogels to instruct cell behavior with mechanical properties or other factors, within a few days or probably even hours, these cells are surrounded by their own nascent matrix. And our hypothesis is that it is really the adhesion to these proteins and the remodeling that allows these cells um, to spread as well as to differentiate into specific lineages. And so while the metabolic labeling that I showed you throughout this presentation, we believe is really a nice tool to globally study the nascent matrix, it doesn't really tell us what is in there. And so we recently started to collaborate um, with Sarah Kelby and her trainee Aya um, at, um, at Boulder because they developed this tool or this strategy to isolate um, these nascent proteins. So basically, when we look at the mixture of nascent proteins with this acide methionine analog and unlabeled proteins, we can use a biotin alkyne linker um, to label these nascent proteins using a cycloaddition again. So which will leave us with these biotin um, labeled nascent proteins. In a second step, we can then use these neutralidin beads, which have a very high affinity to biotin. And so with that, it allows us to actually wash away and remove all the unlabeled proteins that do not have this methionine analog in there. And so since this diazo bond is cleavable, we can then cleave off these beads and we are left with um, purified and enriched nascent proteins. And while we're a little bit delayed um, in analyzing our enriched um, methionine-containing proteins, we already have performed some mass spectrometry on um, these chondrocytes that were cultured in, um, in our hydrogels um, for seven days. And so here using mass spectrometry, we showed there is a quite normal distribution um, of different proteins of the cytosol, the membrane, as well as the, of, the, of the extracellular matrix that we are interested in. And well, we found that these identified ECM or extracellular matrix proteins, not surprisingly, they're involved in processes um, regarding the extracellular matrix as well as um, in collagen organization. So while this is still kind of preliminary, um, we are pretty excited towards using this as a new tool to now understand, for example, how, how do mechanical properties not only change the thickness of nascent matrix, but also the composition um, over time. And so with that, um, I would like to thank you all for your attention and for tuning in. And I would like to thank the Burdick Lab, my postdoc lab, and Jason Burdick, my advisor, as well as our really fantastic collaborators, Robert Mark, um, then Hannah Traxel, and Sarah Calvi at Boulder, and their trainees who actually did the work. Um, so with that, thank you so much for um, your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. That was a fantastic talk. Um, some, some, yeah, some very, very, very interesting work, which is very relevant to my own field. Um, so can I um, just say the question and answer um, box is, is open if people want to uh, post any questions there. Um, we've got some coming in. So there's uh, a very general question from Jeff Clark saying, fantastic presentation. Uh, what are some of the main challenges you've faced? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> there are many challenges we've been facing. Um, so I think in terms of maybe just the technique itself, right? Some of the major challenges are, um, you know, we are introducing a metabolic agent. So 
I think one of the big questions we always have is how does this change um, normal cell behavior, right? And I think this is a problem we have with all our in vitro cultures and perturbation assays, but this is something I constantly think about, how does it perturb um, normal cell behavior? So I think this is a big question, and this is why we kind of have spent some time on changing concentrations and really looking um, at some um, cellular outcomes and comparing them. So that's one of the biggest questions I believe, or like challenges that we've been facing. Um, and yeah, I mean, just technically also um, using different cell types is something you need to readjust the system a little bit, right? And that's why maybe I, I want to say that um, we wrote in Nature Protocols on this whole technique to kind of address all these different questions I've been getting from the community, adapting it to different cell types and culture systems. Yeah. That, that's, uh, that's a very useful for anybody wanting to uh, try this technique, I'm sure. So. Um, We've got a question from Akash saying, interesting work. Are you concerned about AZ groups being inaccessible uh, to fluorescent detection in some proteins? Mm, that's a good or question. Or maybe in, in some scenarios as well, I guess. Yeah. Uh, in some tissues. That's a fantastic question. Um, so I don't know. Um, I think maybe the, the best answer to this question is that we have a lot of AZ groups. So even if we're not detecting 100%, um, we will still get a general distribution, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe that's also one of the biggest reasons we need to do um, mass spectrometry, right? Because then we will actually be able to get a clear answer to what is in there and what is the distribution and what is incorporating um, these SI groups. But that's a great point. Um, yeah, maybe in tissue that might also be if we actually use in vivo or real tissue structures that might be a really important part. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, we have a question from Christine who says, Hi Claudia, do you have any data on how the properties of the hydrogel impact the composition of the, of the nascent matrix in terms of expression and structure? Yeah, I'm glad this question got asked. So this is exactly why we're now doing the mass spectrometry. Um, so we developed the technique for our hydrogel studies and you know, we have the hydrogels ready, we just need to analyze it. So this is exactly the question we want to answer. How does the mechanic, how do mechanical properties change the composition? Great question. Okay. Um, we have an anonymous attendee saying, great talk. I was wondering if you can use the methionine labeling system to capture uh, other metabolites, or is it just capturing the proteins in the nascent matrix? And I had a similar question with regards to maybe capturing sort of um, glycosaminoglycans, which are obviously rele very relevant in in, in yeah. cartilage tissue. Thanks for the question. Um, so this is actually we did um, look into, and um, this is also part of a paper we published. So we did look into sugar labeling. Um, and I do want to mention that there is a lot of different metabolic um, agents available that you can purchase and um, really label um, these sugar and potentially um, the glycose, like the glycans and the, some components or associated um, proteoglycans um, within these glycan structures, right? So this is available. You can also use kind of sugar analogs um, to look at these other components of the matrix. Yeah. And do you see any difference in the radial distribution um, or do they follow a similar profile to the proteins? So what we found so far is that when we use um, the sugar labeling, it seems like at least with the technique we've been using um, that these proteoglycans or at least some of these proteoglycan associated sugars distribute much further into the hydrogel. So similarly to what we've seen with Altium Blue and um, other labeling techniques. Um, sure. Okay, um, so we have a question from Christelle saying, have you ever uh, observed any differences between the nascent proteins produced by different cell types? Uh, for example, primary cell lines versus cancer cells or adherent versus non-adherent cells? Yeah, great question. Um, so I haven't really looked too deep into this topic, but I definitely looked um, into, for example, fibroblasts, and I looked, um, I mean, here today I showed already um, mesenchyma stroma cells and chondrocytes, so we definitely see a difference in the amount of nascent proteins, but as I mentioned, we haven't really um, um, gone, uh, gotten any data on the composition, whether it's different, um, 
But what I can say with some confidence is that all these different cell types produce different amounts of nascent proteins and the thickness will be different. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, we have a couple more questions I think we have time for. Um, so Dilip says, great presentation, Claudia. What was the method used for blocking collagen uh, and fibronectin integrins to the nascent protein? Yeah, thanks. Um, so there um, we use some monoclonal antibodies um, obviously um, without fluorescent, right? So we basically, for collagen, um, we plucked the alpha-2 integrin domain. Um, and for fibronectin, we used an antibody, monoclonal antibody that directly binds to the cell adhesive. So basically the RGD um, binding domain um, of fibronectin. So these are antibodies that have been used by other people in the field to block adhesion um, to specific um, substrates. Yeah, so monoclonal antibodies. Okay. And I think quite, uh, quite an interesting follow-up question from Dilip was uh, integrins for collagen and fibronectin binding are quite broad. So does the blocking efficiency match the rate of the integrin turnover? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And um, we should definitely look deeper into that. Um, so what we found is that, you know, blocking these integrins, um, which I totally agree, they're very broad, um, it reduces cell spreading, but it never completely blocked it. So I think this is also one of the reasons um, that um, you did, were mentioning. Um, and yeah, so the turnover rate, well, that's a great question. Um, I definitely need to look, and that's a very interesting question as well um, that we need to look deeper into. Yeah, good yeah, point. I agree. Um, we've still got time. Um, so Fan says, great work with the nascent protein that actually surrounds the cells. Does this mean that the cell biomaterial interaction is actually regulated by the nascent protein? Well, thanks. Yeah, so that's a good point. And I like this question a lot because um, I think this is an important point that we as biomaterial scientists may need to consider, right? Because if they're surrounded by the nascent matrix, we now also need to understand how does the nascent matrix integrate adhere or even interact with the biomaterial, right? So if you think of a hydrogel, you have the nascent matrix and then the cell is pulling on the matrix. It really also depends how the matrix is kind of interacting with the hydrogel, right? And so that's why I've been looking um, into PEC, so for example, PEC hydrogels versus hyaluronic acid hydrogels. These are all different um, materials and the matrix will adhere or interact very different. So that's a great question that um, we as biomaterial scientists are, are looking into and should be probably. <laughs> All right, one more, time for one more. Yeah. So uh, Andy says, thank you for such an interesting presentation. Uh, so presumably the secretion of new proteins stops after a certain time period. Uh, and do you have any insight into how this feedback mechanism might work? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, so we did look at temporal aspects, right? Um, so, and we found that actually most of the proteins are secreted very early on. And then it's only very limited what these cells are secreting, right? So it seems like they're actually remodeling it. And it's really this very early time window where the hydrogel or whatever surrounding um, is actually pushing, um, you know, or controlling what is secreted by this matrix. And then I think this feedback mechanism may come into, right? So how is the hydrogel still from, you know, allowing the cell or enabling the cell to, to spread through this environment um, to actually use the nascent matrix for their advantage, if that makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the hydrogel is really giving um, kind of feedback to the cell. What can I do with this nascent matrix? Um, but we, yeah, we need to look very specific at different time points and probably, again, at the composition, um, if this is changing instead of the nascent protein secretion and degradation. No, it's really interesting. I think it's kind of making a lot of people think a bit more about what's actually going on at this, uh, at this cell material interface. Um, so thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, we're going to move on to our second speaker now.